Uh, thank you all for coming. It's <coughs> an honor for me to be here and to have the opportunity to learn something about the Italian context with respect to the uh, questions and problems I've been trying to investigate. Um, I spent probably uh, close to 30 years studying the working conditions of teachers and the ways in which schools uh, provide opportunities for learning in the course of daily work. So it's only been in the last few years that I've turned my attention to the way that professionals are prepared for that work in the first place. And the first opportunity came uh, when I got an invitation from University College Oslo to participate in a project across professional fields in entering uh, professional occupations. And it was there that I started reading and learning about issues in education for the health professions first. And then when I became dean, as Francesca has said, I was approached by uh, a person from the Office of Medical Education at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, who was interested in helping physicians uh, and other health professionals, but primarily physicians, who are interested in the quality of medical education and who wish to do research on medical education to get the formal training that they needed to legitimize them and to prepare them to do that kind of work. So we have now developed, uh, as Francesca said, this uh, master's concentration in education for the health professions. Uh, most of the students who have participated have been physicians, but we've also had someone from the pharmacy faculty and the dentistry faculty. Unfortunately, the nursing world is organized in such a way that it makes it hard for them to participate with us. So, I'm going to start out with a caveat here about language. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, I do not speak Italian or understand Italian when spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and I usually speak English very quickly. I'm trying to uh, moderate my pace. Um, so I'll stop periodically and just kind of check in with you, um, and perhaps um, Francesca can help me with this, that if there are questions, um, clarifications needed, and so forth, you could tell her in Italian, and she will tell me in English, uh, if that makes you more comfortable. So, so my motivation here for considering cross-field studies and pursuing them more deeply um, I have a sociological interest. I am a sociologist by training. I have a sociological interest now in education for the professions. Uh, the changing nature of professional work and, and the conditions of professional work in many fields are changing dramatically. Um, and in workplace conditions for professional learning. I also have a practical interest in the improvement of teacher education. And teaching is an unusual field in this respect in that unlike medicine, there is no, at least in the U.S., commonly accepted body of knowledge, no commonly accepted language for describing and analyzing the work of teaching and learning. And teachers often describe their entry into the work as a matter of finding their personal style. Um, so we have a bit of a dilemma in terms of professional education and professional development. And so I'm, uh, my, some of my colleagues and I have really been trying to work toward building better connections between practicing teachers and those of us in universities such that we could develop uh, a shared language and a shared conception of practice. And then of course there's this collaboration with the Office of Med Medical Education which I've been finding very valuable. So, elements of the talk. Um, this talk has three major pieces to it. Uh, first, I want to start out with one version, and it's only one, uh, of conceptions of professional expertise and acquiring professional expertise. Um, because they, it helps me think about the findings from the set of studies that I'll uh, describe to you today. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the findings from two sets of cross-field 
studies, meaning comparisons across different professional fields. Uh, one set carried out by uh, researchers affiliated with the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, and the other carried out by Pamela Grossman and her colleagues and students at Stanford University at about the same time. And then finally, I want to uh, introduce three kinds of innovation that I see uh, in health professions education, all of them actually in medical education. Um, and these are examples locally to me, examples from UC Berkeley, UC San Francisco, and uh, the UCSF partnership with the Veterans Health Administration, which we refer to simply as the VA. Okay, so these perspectives on expertise and professional education, notions of expertise, I'm taking from uh, Mary Kennedy and a paper that's quite old now, a uh, paper she wrote in 1987 that I still find useful. Uh, and if anyone wants me to, I can look up the title of it uh, or make sure that Francesca has it. Uh, but I continue to find this paper useful in thinking about the underlying assumptions that are uh, embodied in programs of professional education. So the first of four conceptions of expertise is expertise as technical knowledge and skill. So this definition really foregrounds the, a body of accepted knowledge, uh, in the case of medical education, often heavily scientific knowledge, uh, anatomical knowledge. Uh, so it foregrounds the tasks and the knowledge uh, that, profession that professionals are expected to acquire in order to be viewed as, as competent. Now, what Kennedy does in introducing each of these definitions is she characterizes uh, the way people think about expertise in this way, but then she also points out limitations to this conception. So in, the, in this case, with professional expertise as uh, technical knowledge and skill, the limitation that she particularly sees is that it misses the purposes, the, the intentionality of professional practice, um, which so you know, grounds professional judgment. You're not making judgment just on the basis of your technical knowledge, but on values and orientations that mark that particular profession. So that's the first definition. The second one is expertise as the application of theory or general principles. Um, so this is, by the way, very common language. And if you read the Carnegie studies over and over in the interviews that they did with people, um, the professional educators say, well, they learn this and then they apply it. So you have coursework and then you apply it to a clinical setting, for example. It's a very common way of thinking about developing professional expertise. But there's some major limitations to this. First of all, the real world out there is a whole lot messier than the principles. So real world cases don't present themselves to you as a case of a particular principle. And any given problem that you face, whether it's a sick patient or a child having difficulty learning a mathematical concept, a number of different principles could apply to the solution to that case. So it's not a neat, tidy, have this principle and apply it in practice. A third definition or conception is expertise as critical analysis the analysis of situations. This is really common in our uh, system of legal education in the United States, where uh, prospective lawyers spend three years learning how, quote, to think like a lawyer, or more appropriately, or more accurately, to think like an appellate judge, because the curriculum is built around cases that are appeals court cases. So you spend three years learning to, quote, think like a lawyer. And a few years ago, it was 2011, on the front page of the New York Times, uh, there was a picture of men in suits, ties, around a table. And the headline says, what they don't, te it's obviously a corporate setting, corporate office of some sort, uh, law firm. 
and the headline said, what they don't teach in law school, lawyering, doing the work of the law. What was interesting to me is all the comments that followed, this is an online article, all the comments. The comments that came from law professors said, but what we teach is how to think like a lawyer. And the comments that came from practicing lawyers criticized the arrogance of law schools for thinking that thinking like a lawyer was enough. So this is, it's a common principle, but it's under considerable um, criticism as well. And what Kennedy says about this principle is that the focus on analysis may come at the expense of being prepared to act. And if you think about medical education in particular, one has to be prepared to act, often quickly and under conditions of considerable uncertainty. And my, um, the surgeons who have participated in my um, little reading group on issues in education for the professions particularly talk about, uh, as you become a surgeon, being prepared there is no choice but to act under conditions that could be quite uncertain. All right, the fourth conception that Kennedy introduces, and one that resonates with a number of other theorists, obviously, uh, is expertise as what she calls deliberate action. It's situated, it's embodied. Um, this owes a debt to Schoen's work. Uh, you can think about a number of the Dreyfus and Dreyfus work and so forth. Um, in particular, Schoen, I think, because his model of situated expertise grew out of his studies of practicing architects, scientists, and so forth. So let me take my first pause and check break here. How are we doing on language? People have things they want to ask Francesca to clarify. Okay, keep moving. Okay. okay, so I'm going to start with uh, studies that were commissioned by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, it or if you haven't heard of it, you may have heard of Flexner. Um, because the Carnegie Foundation in 1910, or at least the report was issued in 1910, commissioned Abraham Flexner to do a report on the state of medical education in the U.S. and Canada. So here's Abraham, um, and here's his report. Uh, and it was quite a damning report. He found a small number of programs to admire, principally among them Johns Hopkins Medical School. Um, but he was generally pretty appalled, uh, pretty unhappy with uh, what he observed. He observed what he described as mind-numbing lectures, um, low-level apprenticeship conditions, um, the absence of really uh, credibly professional faculty, a number of other deficiencies, including deficiencies in facilities. And his report either directly resulted in, or at least accelerated, the closure of a number of institutions, programs, uh, including, unfortunately, some uh, of the early ones to prepare women and minorities uh, for work in medicine. Uh, and his report laid the foundation for the structure of the medical curriculum in the U.S. anyway for the last hundred years. And that's now beginning to change. So fast forward a hundred years, or nearly a hundred <coughs> years, uh, still with the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. and. The Carnegie Foundation is an unusual place in that when the leadership changes, the entire agenda changes. So when Lee Shulman became the president of the Carnegie Foundation in the mid-90s, mid to late 90s, he, uh, he'd been interested in professional education for a long time and often held up medical education as an exemplar for those of us in teacher education as something we should follow. Um, he launched a study of uh, preparation for the professions in five fields. Uh, the clergy, the law, nursing, medicine, and engineering. And in a paper that I've supplied to my discussants, I talk about the 
uh, medicine, nursing, and engineering volume. I'm not going to talk about engineering here, although it has some interesting discoveries associated with it. Um, so these studies were carried out roughly at the same time, and the most recent volume, which is the last volume, which is the one on medicine, was just published in 2010. Um, there were two organizing ideas for the Carnegie studies. One was the idea of signature pedagogies in the professions. Now, uh, in fact, before any of these studies actually began, uh, Shulman had published an essay on signature pedagogies. And by that, he meant the, the, the way of approaching medical, or I mean, professional education in each field that had grown up historically. It isn't as if um, they necessarily thought about how can we approach preparation so that it really prepares people for the work they'll be doing. They, these signature pedagogies, it's probably too much to call them historical accidents, uh, but they certainly had their own characteristic historic roots. So in the law, uh, in the U.S., not everywhere, but in the U.S., very much rooted to case law. Uh, the example in medicine was the idea of hospital-based teaching, uh, te the teaching hospital with its uh, ritual of the grand rounds. That's the image there, as a, as a signature pedagogy. Um, so there's no romanticizing, in a way, although I think Shulman was very fond of the grand, the grand rounds idea. Uh, there's not really a, a romantic view or the notion that these signature pedagogies are necessarily good things. They're characteristic of a profession. But the other organizing idea does have an ideal notion attached to it. The idea of a high-level apprenticeship. Not like the old master-apprentice relationship um, where you follow in the footsteps uh, or the shadows, whatever, of a single master apprentice and eventually um, are told that you're, you're ready to practice. They're thinking here more institutionally of programs of preparation that combine foundational skill or foundational knowledge, uh, skilled practice, and the development of an identity that particularly in, uh, involves ethical commitments. So, those are the two anchoring ideas, but my thought here is that they are really fundamentally in tension, um, or could be, or could be in conflict. And an, an interesting question is, to what extent, in any field, does the signature pedagogy, or a set of signature ways of preparing people, achieve the ideals of high-level apprenticeship? So we add to, uh, to those tensions the fact that much of professional education now, didn't all, wasn't always, occurs in the context of institutions of higher education in universities. And universities, at least um, in the US, um, are not necessarily hospitable places for the professions, welcoming places. There's a great deal of institutional ambivalence about the place of professional schools, especially in elite universities. And a number of people have written about this. So <clears throat> universities tend to privilege the academic and theoretical over the practical. Uh, in, in fact, in the New York Times article that I mentioned a minute ago about the law, the article charges the universities with being allergic to the practical. But interestingly, they say if law if law schools behaved like if medical schools behaved like law schools, you would never find a practicing physician or an MD in the professoriate. So there are clearly exceptions to this characterization. Um, here's a quote from Bill Sullivan, who wrote the book Work and Integrity. It's, it's actually the lead volume in the Carnegie series. Uh, introduces the entire problem of um, giving professions, robust homes in universities. He says, the strengths of the academic model are efficiency in systematic transmission of ideas and information, along with at least some guarantee that the knowledge communicated to students is reputable and up to date. 
Its weaknesses lie in rel relative abstraction from actual application of knowledge to practice, along with general avoidance of the embedded knowledge of practice itself. So, turning to the Carnegie study <coughs> findings, um, I'm going to focus just on nursing and medicine here, but I'm asking how do nursing education and medical education accomplish high-level apprenticeship through their signature pedagogies? And what conceptions of expertise do they reflect? Thinking back to Kennedy. So let's take nursing education first. All right, so this diagrammatic representation here um, characterizes the what I think of as the modal portrait, the main way that they encountered uh, nursing education. I wonder if I can do this with... Okay, so what you see here, there's a reason these things are divided. There's a space in between them. Um, so and this will come to be a theme in the Carnegie work. Uh, a real separation between the classroom instruction that nurses encountered and their education in their clinical placements. Uh, so, nurses encountered their content uh, base through lectures, through PowerPoint presentations, and I call this the curse of the PowerPoint, which you are experiencing right here, that um, day after day of dense content presented in PowerPoint format. And as you know, with, with um, the scientific content of nursing and medicine, escalating dramatically, those slides just keep getting denser and denser and more and more of them, right? Um, so that characterized most of the classroom instruction, and yet the clinical work over here, I'm just going to physically move, was a very different matter altogether. And for nursing, at least in the U.S., the clinical work begins on day one. It begins right at the beginning so you've got these two things, the classroom and the field, are linked in time. These are all happening simultaneously. You have a classroom and then in the same day, same week, you're in the field. Linked in time, that means since you're starting in the field with real patients on day one, the stakes are high. The cost of error is very high. You could make a consequential mistake. So. Because of that, the situations that nurses are in uh, start out very simple. Uh, real patients, but simple tasks, and one patient at a time. When you're ready, you move to two or more patients and more complex practices. And you're learning directly with close supervision in and from and for practice. And they talk in the book about look, developing a sense of salience. Here's this. Kennedy notion of analyzing a situation. Through the clinical, the nurses develop an idea of what matters in a situation. Um, and so, for example, when they're learning about uh, administering uh, medications, uh, you can find there's a story in the book of, you know, the, the beginning nurse is fixated. The job for the week is to really understand uh, routines for the administration of medications. So, what drug, what dose, what time, is it the right patient, <laughs> um, right? So those are all routines, the organizing questions that you go through, the checklist of questions. But you, what you may miss when you walk in the room is that the patient is freezing and needs a blanket. Right? So being able to get a sense of what is salient, what matters, is a big part of the clinical side. Through all of this as well, they speak of nurses developing a sense of identity, strong ethical commitments, and becoming a nurse in a, in a really profound and collective way. They did find a small set of what they called paradigmatic cases uh, where the classroom and the clinic, uh, clinical experience were tightly integrated. So still linked in time, but now also linked in orientation and often linked by the same faculty. 
So you've got faculty who share classroom and clinical responsibilities. So, so that means that in the classroom, you've got, instead of the endless PowerPoint slides, now what you have are what-if scenarios. You've got real patient cases and real patient stories as the basis for the discussion. You've got um, role-playing. Uh, one of the things they uh, spoke of playing is preparing a nurse to call a doctor. The nurse is with the patient more. The nurse sees something that might call for either the doctor to visit or for a change in medication. How do you have the phone conversation in a way that gets the attention of the doctor who's very busy and gets the outcome you want? So they rehearsed things like com telephone conversations with physicians. Um, they also talked about um, the way they would assess knowledge differently. And, and by the way, formative assessment is becoming very much a prominent part of the discussion in uh, both medicine and nursing. So here's a quote from one educator. If we are asking a question about heart failure, this is in a nursing classroom, we're not going to ask what's the difference between right-sided and left-sided heart failure physiologically. We're going to ask a question about how a nurse would care for a patient in left-sided heart failure. And the student would be expected to know that care would be designed primarily around respiratory issues. So a different kind of discourse than uh, listening to PowerPoint slides. So, in medical education, we've got a separation of all three components uh, with, again, foundational knowledge primarily through lecture pedagogy in the, in the classroom or s separate labs. Uh, but a sequential curriculum with foundational coursework coming first over a two-year period and then turning to clinical work uh, after, after the basic coursework is, is completed. So ba the basic structure promoted by Abraham Flexner more than a century ago really remains the modal condition um, in the U.S. Um, so two years of foundational courses followed by two years of clinical preparation and additional years of residency-based specialization. Um, the increasing specialization in med medicine, of course, makes this um, to just reinforces this model or has. Um, let me see here. Let me see. Okay. So, but here too, uh, the researchers found some interesting cases of more integrative uh, programs where foundational knowledge, practice, and professional formation came together. Oops, I need to backtrack here a minute. Under the identity formation, they didn't even talk about it in this book about forming an identity of becoming a physician. There is more of an entering into the field, being socialized into the field, seeing yourself as advancing the field of medicine. Um, but they also talked about the negative effects of very intensive internships and medical residencies, where you're working now under U.S. law, you're not supposed to work more than 80 hours a week, which is still plenty. Um, and some, some physicians complain that, oh, you're missing the fundamental experience of, uh, yeah. uh, but there's substantial research that what that does is strip away any sense of empathy for patients uh, from physicians. It actually, instead of helping build a sense of connection to patients and empathy and ethical responsibility, it actually uh, has a corrosive effect on young physicians, so that would be worth changing. Um, so there are examples in, in uh, the study of educating physicians about new integrative possibilities. Some of those result, result from two things. One are advances in technology, so you can get these very sophisticated mannequins that mimic patient symptoms, um, but also the escalation of the consumer health movement. So you've got a lot more um, sensitivity to liability, I think, is one way of putting it. So doing things in sim simulations with standardized patients, standardized nurses, and so forth, rather than subjecting um, real patients to um, novice intervention is beginning to happen. And earlier clinical experience. So they're more linked in time, 
there's still the progressively higher stakes. Unlike nurses who start day one with patients, most doctors don't. And as we move more toward interprofessional preparation, that's turning out to be one of the issues where uh, you get a team together and it turns out the nurses have been caring for patients since the beginning and the physicians are just now encountering patients for the first time. But the physicians are accustomed to having higher status. So it's an interesting cultural shift. So themes in the Carnegie studies, overall a deep divide between the pedagogies of knowledge acquisition and the pedagogies of practice across field. And by the way, the use of word pedagogies in the U.S. context means the practices of professional preparation, not just the theory. There's a difference, in, I know, in the European use of the word pedagogy. Um, so the prominence of identity formation and ethical commitments in nursing and in the clergy. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about that study here, but that's also very much a prominent piece of education for the clergy. Uh, less so in medicine, less so in engineering, less so in the law. Um, but also a kind of hopeful note, an optimistic note in each of these studies about uh, places where they found innovation and greater integration. Okay. Um, so I want to turn now to <coughs> Pam Grossman at Stanford. It was doing these studies of clinical psychology, the clergy, and teacher education there at about the same time that the Carnegie studies were going on. Uh, I'm not going to uh, dwell a lot on the details of each of those studies. Um, I'd be happy to talk afterward about about those if you would like, but so just a quick overview because I want to move on to the contribution, the conceptual contribution and related practical contribution that I think Grossman has made. Um, so the fields that she studied really did differ in the kind of pedagogical they supported in the university setting um, for developing knowledge and skill and judgment and identity. So both clinical psychology and um, education for the clergy, but not teaching, showed systematic attentiveness to the kind of dynamic nature of practice, this deliberative practice notion of expertise that Kennedy talked about. Um, so there were, in those programs, you really see a way of joining the signature pedagogies with this aspiration to high-level apprenticeship. What I find useful about what she's done is what she, what she took away from that um, and what she used to form what she's calling um, pedago a pedagogies of practice framework. So what she noticed in the, in the clergy and in developmental psychology, uh, clinical psychology rather, um, was that the professional educators had, had done three different kinds of work to link theory and practice. One is that they really thought very carefully about the representations of practice that the novices encountered. Um, different ways that practice is represented and how, they, how it just makes the world of practice accessible to people without fully entering into it. Second, she talks about the decomposition of practice, taking, figuring out what to highlight, particularly for novices, taking constituent parts of a practice. So in the uh, clergy, for example, she speaks of an entire class that was built around helping uh, beginning clergy uh, interpret text and read from text in a way that made the meaning accessible to a congregation. Uh, in clinical psychology, talking about practicing ways of interacting with patients to deal with uh, resistance, problems of resistance to therapy, uh, and doing that in the context of the, of the classroom. Um, let me just see here. So I think of her developing, oh, and the third one being approximations to practice. And these are a series of situations that people are in that come closer and closer to representing authentic practice. This isn't coming, I've got an example here that isn't from um, either Grossman or Carnegie, but, but perfectly to me captures 
uh, this notion of progressive, authentic work. A student of mine who's a teacher educator did a study of the police, preparation of the police. Um, got herself access to a police academy, which I have to say, coming from Berkeley, was no small feat, uh, because Berkeley has a reputation of being, you know, not necessarily fond of the police and uh, the home of the free speech movement and so forth. But Jessica got access to a police academy and discovered that they prepare police through a series of scenarios that get increasingly more complicated in terms of the level of danger they represent and the level of uncertainty. And they teach them routines for handling these kinds of settings. Um, and so you can't get out of the academy unless you pass assessments in all of these increasing levels of, of scenarios. So um, it really struck me. These are approximations to practice in, in a very structured, well thought out way. Okay. I wanted to say there. So I think what, I mean, through Grossman's work, what we have a way to do is to design, um, not just live with historical, historically developed signature pedagogies, but to design curriculum and pedagogy in such a way that it accomplishes this approximation to practice. I think it looks more simple here than it is, a lot more simple, because the choice you make when you decompose complex, complex practice into uh, simpler chunks, which ones are you going to choose and which ones are you going to leave out? What are your priorities going to be? So my teacher education colleagues at the University of Michigan have picked one, an example of one practice that they decomposed, which is how to orchestrate whole class discussions. Very hard to do well. And so that's one decomposed practice that that they've centered on. But I, I think the choice for any field about what what the representations are, what the decomposed practices are, that's a complicated matter in its own right. I do want to take a minute to, to just um, say something about practice. It's easy to think about practice as a kind of low level enterprise, it's what we do, it's behavior, and that would be a mistake. Um, so let's just take medicine, for example. You think about practice as embodied in interaction, it's embedded in a system of meaning. Um, I like the Cook and, there's an article by Cook and Brown, um, the late 1990s, on this matter where they, they differentiate from mere behavior. So take the picture here, the Dr. Tapping, you know, with using the reflex hammer, tapping the knee, the, the knee popping up. You can imagine a child sitting around doing that for fun to watch the light pop up. That would be kind of mere behavior. You can imagine someone demonstrating it as something a doctor would do in an exam, and that's a deliberate action. You're treating it as a component of some recognizable medical practice. But to do it in this context embeds it in a system of meaning in the context of a medical examination or an interview that can be evaluated on the basis of whether it reaches an acceptable level of proficiency. So practices are, are joined to institutionalizing me mechanisms. Um, they're not just a matter of personal style or preference. They are tied to um, routines, to category systems, to roles, to tools that exist independent of the individual practitioner. So here we have in the uh, medical exam the routine. We have the symbolism of the white coat. Uh, we have the tool, a reflex hammer. We have the clinical setting. We're not just out in the street or in the waiting room. We are in the clinic. Um, and we have categories of normal and abnormal. And as we were noticing earlier today, I sat with um, Francesca and colleagues looking at some data on patient-doctor interaction. This also makes it look a whole lot simpler than it is, and there are all the ambiguities that physicians have to learn to navigate as they have real medical interviews. So how do we build on the Carnegie and Grossman studies? Um, 
I think there are four you could do, and I'm going to stop after the slide to again ask if anybody needs to clarification or restatement. Um, we could attend systematically to the pedagogy of professional education and the conceptions of learning and teaching that underlie it. I think you could, for most of what was apparent in the Carnegie studies, the, concept, the first three conceptions in Kennedy, the foundational knowledge and skill, um, the analytic capacity and the applying principles to practice are, are readily visible. The last is less so, and maybe programs are willing to just live with that limitation. We could consider the relationship of signature pedagogies to the actual problems, the core problems and tasks of the work. We could innovate in relation to those core problems of the work and to the changing contexts of work that are now surrounding us. And we could create a research agenda that credits the complexity of that work and informs our practice. So, I'm going to move from that to a description of some um, innovations I see going on around me, but let me stop for a minute. Do we have people okay? I need to talk slower or faster. I know it's hard to listen fast so, in another language. People okay? Okay, so let's take the case of medical education. Um, there are three developments, and, and that one, one thing I'm curious about here is, do they strike people in this room as innovative or not? Um, it's not my field, um, right? So I'm just beginning to have conversations um, with my colleagues in this field, and, and I'm trying to figure out how to make sense of what I'm learning for purposes of teacher education. So, uh, so the first is um, innova innovations that reflect a perspective of deliberative action, again back to the Kennedy, and structured approximations of practice. Um, and that's the joint medical program at Berkeley. I'll describe that in a minute. Uh, second, innovations reflecting changes in the institutional context of medical practice, where, at least where I am, we're moving much more to, toward deliberate organized team-based care and um, an emphasis on interprofessional communication. Uh, and finally, innovations in the goals, priorities, and activities of a medical education faculty. Uh, and that's the role of the Office of Research and Development in Medical Education at UCSF. So, the first one. The Joint Medical Program at Berkeley is small. Many people on campus don't even know it's there. It started in 1971, and over the last 20 years or so, has evolved toward uh, what they're calling the Helix Curriculum, double-stranded curriculum, uh, which I'll describe in a minute. Uh, they've got a real emphasis. They recruit uh, people who are interested in being, uh, I suppose, activist positions. They're really committed to urban medical practice, um, particularly for the urban underserved. Um, so it tends to be one of the more diverse programs, more diverse um, ethnically and in class terms than UCSF population would be. They, it's a joint degree. They get a master's degree, regular master's degree at Berkeley on the basis of a master's project that's an inquiry into some aspect of community-based medicine. Um, and then they get their MD from UCSF. They go there for their regular clinical years. So the Helix curriculum, you can go on the website, look up Joint Medical Program at Berkeley, and you'll find anything you might want to know. Um, but as described here, uh, the Helix Medical Curriculum consists of two complementary strands, problem-based learning and workplace learning and patient care. The intertwined strands integrate learning in both classroom and clinical settings. Students' medical knowledge and clinical skills develop together as they're applied together in the um, in the care of patients. Um, these pictures were just taken recently because this young man over here served on the search committee for the new director, which I chaired. That's Simon. All right, so problem-based learning in the JMP. So I have, if anyone would like, I can send this electronically. There are 77 case-based um, problem sets, basically. 
Um, the students start out, the only regular traditional course they take is a course in anatomy the first summer. Then it's entirely problem-based, case-based learning. The instructor runs 77 crafted patient scenarios, uh, so the, and they each take about a week. So they, the, patient, the students come and they get an initial characterization of a patient. Uh, they get some additional materials. They spend time individually and in a group developing their content understanding around this, uh, this case, the relevant medicine and science, um, and develop, basically come to a, a plan for treatment uh, based on what they learn. And they teach each other. They do a kind of division of labor and teach each other what they learn about the science and the medicine. So here's uh, an example of the first three, a uh, summary of the first three problem cases. Um, I've got all 77, uh, but the first one is uh, a case called Jenny Forrester, that's the patient's name. Uh, the primary diagnosis is pneumothorax, um, summary of who she is, a 22-year-old woman with chest pain and so forth, and so there's a whole list of them. Um, and by the way, I don't have an article on my computer, but my understanding is that the outcomes from this program, in terms of knowledge, pass, rates of passing the medical boards, for example, um, third year, um, is that there's really no statistical difference between the, in the content knowledge from the students who go through this and the students who go through the conventional coursework. And that is good news. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right? um, it doesn't have to be better. It just can't be worse. <laughs> um, so, so that is good news. But what there is, and I don't know how much of this is written out, but what I've been hearing from the faculty on both sides is that there's a difference in the kind of physician these people are preparing to be. That they, have, they come into their clini the formal clinical years um, much more likely to, to dig in themselves to the nature of a patient case. To They just behave differently on the basis of, and much more likely to act as teams. <clears throat> Um, so they also have this workplace-based and context-based learning. They have clinical placements from the beginning in inpatient, outpatient, and emergency care settings. So one of the ways we're seeing the field shift is that teaching hospitals are no longer the kind of place for medical education they used to be. They used to be places of longer-term care, so you could see a patient trajectory more. Now they're places of shorter-term acute care, and so that shift toward more outpatient settings is one thing that we're, we're seeing. Uh, the students also run what they call the suitcase clinic. Uh, it's a clinic for low income and homeless uh, people in the Berkeley, Oakland area. And it's staffed by an MD, a nurse practitioner, and a, a rotating group of the volunteer students. And then they do their master's project. Okay, the second uh, case of innovation is this project um, between UCSF, University of San Francisco, and the Veterans Health Administration, or VA, with a focus on team-based care and interprofessional communication. The San Francisco site is one of five national sites, all working on the same set of developments. Um, what they've done is introduce what they call PACT, patient-aligned care teams. Um, and they've established, they realize they can't just pull pe people together and give them time to do something and expect they're going to know what to do. So they've established a parallel program to prepare the team members and to map it backwards into their um, medical education program. So they bring together primarily resident physicians and nurse practitioners uh, and then flesh out the team as needed with social workers, dentists, pharmacists, whatever. Um, and they're conducting research on how it's going but we can talk about that if you would like. Um, and this really represents an institutional shift. So here's uh, one article talking about the way things have been up till now. This is the usual case um, in the VA. The health profession's education activities have been mostly hospital-based and mostly organized with an emphasis on each profession being trained separately. So this is where we're going to try and show you a video. <laughs> um, I'm going to escape out of this for a second and see if I can get to 
So um, the video I'm going to show you is one that's been prepared by UCSF regarding its what's calling the new bridging curriculum, bridges curriculum. And it's reflective of this interest in preparing people to operate in teams and um, engage in interprofessional communication. And what the, what the video does is give you a, ra a sort of rationale based in the personal experience of one first year medical student. And the, uh, the talk may go by a little fast, but I think the drawings will help you see what, uh, what argument they're making. Of the healthcare system over the past 20 years or so. She used to be really the... Have you ever experienced gaps in your healthcare? You know, where it could have been better, but it wasn't? My grandmother is 81 now, and she's had lots of interactions with the healthcare system over the past 20 years or so. She used to be really physically active, enjoyed walking and swimming. She really took care of herself. Then she developed arthritis, and slowly over the years she developed something called a valgus deformity in her knees, and it got harder and harder for her to walk. My dad suggested that she meet with an orthopedic surgeon to talk about the possibility of a knee surgery. She refused, however, because one of her good friends had experienced a slow, painful recovery following a knee replacement, and she was afraid of the same thing happening to her. As her knees got worse, she stopped exercising and gained roughly 40 pounds over the next 10 years. Around this time, she also began experiencing episodes of atrial fibrillation, for which she was prescribed anticoagulants. Shortly after, in the spring of 2001, my grandmother experienced the grief of losing her daughter, my aunt, to melanoma. She began showing signs of depression, but was not placed on an antidepressant at her own insistence. In the past 10 years, her knees have deteriorated to the point where she can't walk at all. She now uses a wheelchair. Two years ago, her cardiologist diagnosed her with mild congestive heart failure. Today, she lives in an assisted living facility where we visit her every chance that we get. She says that she's happy there. I have to wonder, though, if our healthcare system has failed my grandmother in certain ways. It's not that she doesn't have access to good care. She has the resources to afford great medical care. Instead, I think that her lack of trust in doctors, along with her lack of continuity of care, have led her to the less than ideal situation that she finds herself in today. I know that my grandmother is as strong-willed as she is loving, but at the same time, I have to wonder if maybe her doctors never took the time to explain to her all of the benefits of a knee replacement. Maybe they didn't have the time at all. Maybe there's a way doctors can work better with other healthcare professionals and processes to make sure that people like my grandmother can get the preventative and chronic care that they need before everything gets so much worse. The goal of the UCSF Bridges curriculum is to better prepare physicians to contribute more than clinical experience to the complex systems in which they work. Students and the physicians they will become need to learn to work collaboratively and innovate continuously within systems to improve the care we can deliver to our patients so that biomedical advances today translate into improved health tomorrow. To do this, the Bridges curriculum will provide authentic workplace learning experiences that leverage the talents and commitment of our students to improve health today while sustaining these skills in future practice.
probably don't really need this, uh, bring me to, it brings me to the third point of innovation here, and that has to do with the role of the Office of Medical Education at UC San Francisco. Um, and over, first of all, the way it's staffed. Um, this is a combination of people with medical backgrounds, MDs, uh, and others, social science researchers, and education specialists. Um, and I think it's really probably pretty unusual in that regard. Um, you can go, if you go on their website, and I'm giving you the URL down here, you'll, and poke around, you'll see a whole long list of activities of various sorts that they engage in, but I've picked just a few here. The Teaching Scholars Program um, invites people who are um, on the UCSF faculty who provide mentoring and so forth and uh, educational experiences for interns and residents to get better at what they do, to not take teaching and mentoring for granted. Um, they do probably 80 faculty development workshops a year that are well subscribed on different, different topics. Um, they've just created, there are a series of possibilities in this Pathways to Discovery uh, initiative that allows uh, people to choose kind of unusual areas of specialization that are, are again, more integrative around real world problems. Um, health professions education is one of them. They uh, celebrate their own involvement in research, they prioritize it, and they hold weekly what they call escape sessions. I think it's um, education scholarship conference or consultation, something like that, is what the ESC stands for, uh, where people bring the research that they're doing. The research on the VA, the interprofessional communication at the VA, is one of the cases that they would bring there. Um, but they also have a journal club where they read research. Um, uh, that happens maybe once a month, I think. Um, and they, they, on their website, publicize the master's degree concentration that they have with us at Berkeley. Uh, so that people can get formal, a formal degree and formal training in research methods, learning theory, and so forth. Um, and they, of course, are heavily involved in this new uh, UCSF Bridges curriculum. So, with that, um, this is the end and check. Um, interested in what my discussants have to say, but also in your uh, curiosities and any clarifications you want and ideas you may have that I could take back with me. Thank you.